and we'll see what happened in his life and what God did with him through him. Second Chronicles 33, 1 to 20. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had broken down, and he erected altars to the Baals and made Asheroth, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he burned his sons as an offering in the valley of the son of Hinnom. And used fortune-telling and omens and sorcery and dealt with mediums and with necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. And the carved image of the idol that he had made, he set in the house of God, of which God said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will no more remove the foot of Israel from the land that I appointed for your fathers, if only they will be careful to do all that I have commanded them, all the law, the statutes, and the rules given through Moses. Manasseh led Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem astray to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they paid no attention. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, who captured Manasseh with hooks, bound him with chains of bronze, and brought him to Babylon. When he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and the Lord was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea. And brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Afterward, he built an outer wall for the city of David, west of Gihon in the valley, for the entrance into the fish gate, and carried it around Ophel, and raised it to a very great height. He also put commanders of the army in all of the fortified <coughs> sorry, cities in Judah. And he took away the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built on the mountain of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem, and he threw them outside of the city. He also restored the altar of the Lord and offered on it sacrifices of peace offerings and of thanksgiving. And he commanded Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed at the high places, but only to the Lord their God. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and his prayer to his God, and the words of the seers who spoke to him in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, they are in the chronicles of the kings of Israel. And his prayer, and how God was moved by his entreaty, and all his sin and his faithlessness, and the sites on which he built high places and set up the Asherim and the images, before he humbled himself, behold, they are written in the chronicles of the seers. So Manasseh slept with his father's And they buried him in his house, and Ammon, his son, reigned in his place. It's our reading. We're going to be focusing particularly on what we have in verse 12 and 13, where it says, And when he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea, and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Thanks. Today, we are looking at one of the the greatest redemption arcs in all of the Bible. 
Manasseh wasn't just someone who was running from God or ignoring God. Manasseh was someone who was spitting in the face of God. You know, if you read through Second Chronicles or read through the book of Kings, you'll see that, that there were kings of Judah who, you know, didn't do what was right and who kind of ignored the Lord. There were many, for example, who, who ignored the temple. And you'll read later of their descendants who would come by and who would fix up some of the things that were in the temple, that were in God's house. But Manasseh is someone who took the temple of the Lord and filled it with idols for other gods and goddesses. Read in both the, the courts of the temple of the Lord, he, he built altars you know, for the, the Baals, the, the gods worshipped by the Canaanites, the Ashtaroth, those were like the goddesses worshipped by the Canaanites. He built altars to the, the starry hosts, you know, to the sun, the moon, the stars, which were often worshipped as gods and goddesses in the ancient world. It's almost like he wanted to pick a fight with God. He's like, I am going to take your house and I am going to make it all about worshipping these other gods. And God would forgive him. Manasseh had an amazing father, Hezekiah. Hezekiah was one of the most faithful kings of Judah. You know, someone who was bound and determined throughout his life to, to bring the people of Israel back to God. And Manasseh, he comes along and he undoes all of that. Well, they told he rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had demolished. And he also erected altars to the Baals and made Asherah poles, bowed down to all those false gods, ignoring the legacy of his father. And God would forgive him. We are told that Manasseh sacrificed his children on the fires, the altars of the false gods. He practiced divination and, and witchcraft, seeking to influence the spirits. He sought omens. He consulted with the mediums, the witches, the spiritists, or necromancers. Not only himself, but he also led the entire nation of, of Judah and the people of Jerusalem astray. Led them away from God so that we're told they did more evil than that of all those nations that God had driven out before the Israelites during the time of the conquest. You read about that in Joshua. And God would forgive him. What we have in the story of Manasseh is a reminder that there are no limits on God's forgiveness. You can never tell yourself, I can never be forgiven for the things I've done. No one should ever have the audacity to think God would never accept me into his family. And you should never think of another person. Anyone you come across in your life. Oh, that person over there, they're beyond salvation. That person over there, they would never be a part of God's family. Just look at all the horrible things they have done. 
God was willing to forgive Manasseh after he led not just himself, but the entire nation over which he ruled. Rebellion against God. And God forgave him simply in response to a prayer. Maybe you have done some really bad things. You know, you've done things that you can never talk about with other people. Because you just know it will horrify them and it will completely change their perspective of you and who you are. And you're just like, I could never go there. Or maybe you've done some things you you just aren't proud of. You know, they're they're not necessarily like the worst. They're, They're not necessarily criminal per se. You just know people would see you as a little less if they knew about it. Or maybe you're actually a pretty stand-up person in most ways. You just have a few weaknesses you can never seem to overcome. Maybe you have that one persistent sin in your life which just never seems to go away and You know, you wrestle with it over and over again. No matter what you have done or find yourself even involved in at this moment, no matter the past or the present struggles, you need to recognize there are no limits on God's forgiveness. Nothing which puts you beyond the pale, as they used to say, You know, in Matthew 18, there's the parable of the unmerciful servant. I'm going to make us look at it now. I probably should have put it up in the readings. I didn't throw it in there. But Matthew 18, beginning at verse 21. We read there of a time in the ministry of Jesus Christ where Peter his apostle, his disciple, his main man, comes up to him and says to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. I want you to recognize that a single talent, which was a unit of measure or currency back then, was about 20 years' wages for the average person. So I want you to imagine... Put yourself in the shoes of this person who owes 10,000 talents or 200,000 times your annual income. Suddenly housing prices in the valley don't seem so bad. Jesus wants Peter to see he, regular man, What he owes God, being a regular human being, is like 200,000 years of debt. Which is to say, it is a debt he will not be able to pay off. And yet, what happens with that 10,000 talents of debt in the parable of the unmerciful servant? We are told that the servant fell on his knees, imploring his master, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him, forgave him the debt. Just gone. We have a God who does not have limits 
when it comes to forgiveness. You can't go too low so far down. He will be unwilling to raise you back up. Jesus tells us that he, the Son of Man, God's chosen servant, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom or a payment for many. The pound of flesh you owe God was carved from the body of Christ. Whatever penalty your sins deserve, Christ has paid for. 1 Peter 1, which we read earlier as part of our confession and assurance. So this, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed, claimed from the empty way of life handed down by your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. God's forgiveness is freely given because Christ has paid for all of our wrongdoings. And his blood is of such infinite value. What he has done is so spectacularly worthwhile. It is more than sufficient to cover for us. It was sufficient even for someone like Manasseh, who had done nothing to deserve it. Now, 2 Chronicles 33, verse 10 tells us that, that the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they na- paid no attention. He was a very stubborn one. In the book of Kings, we actually get to read some of the things that God's servants said to Manasseh on God's behalf. Now, the prophets who were sent by God, they came, they announced, Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these detestable sins. He has done more evil than the Amorites who preceded him, has led Judah into sin with his idols. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I'm going to bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. And that's precisely what God did. God brought against the people of Judah the Assyrians. The Assyrians, they took Manasseh prisoner. They put a hook, most likely in his nose, bound him with bronze shackled, dragged him off to Babylon, a faraway city. Manasseh was taken prisoner. But here's the thing. He was already a prisoner. God was just showing them the reality of where he was at. Because he was a a prisoner to sin and the devil. He just didn't see it, didn't know it. The way we can fail to see it, quite honestly. Because here's the thing, if you aren't at this moment looking to God, if you aren't trusting in Jesus Christ to have paid for your sins, to have made up for the things you have done. If you don't accept, believe in the one Redeemer, you're a prisoner of someone much worse than the Assyrians. I'll point you to what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 25-26. Where it says, opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil 
who has taken them captive to do his will. And so if you don't believe, if you're here just because your parents want you to be here, or your spouse wants you to be here, or your friends want you to be here, if you're here just because it's convenient, you know, because it won't ruffle anyone's feathers, or if you're here perhaps just for the, the first time, you're really kind of unsure about this whole Christianity thing. If you don't believe, I hope and pray with many others that you soon will. And I hope and pray that God will help you to overcome whatever obstacles it is in your heart or mind that are keeping you from seeking his free and abundant salvation, forgiveness, blessings. I hope you might get to experience the amazing new freedom that is offered in Jesus Christ. Because what the Bible tells us clearly is you are in either in one of two situations, whether you see it that way or not. You are either captive to the devil, enslaved to him, and he is setting out to destroy you. Or you are going to be freed, claimed, loved in Jesus Christ. And he will care for you now and for all eternity that you might become all that God desires for you to abundantly be. We're told that in his distress, Manasseh sought the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly for the God of his ancestors. I hope you don't have to endure that kind of stress before you see your need for Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But I do hope and pray that you will join with countless others in seeking the favor of the Lord like Manasseh did. And humbling yourself before the Lord like Manasseh did. And I recognize that kind, of, that kind of language of humbling yourself isn't very popular today. Like I can't think of any situations outside of the church where someone has you know, come along and been like, you need to humble yourself. Like as a society, we value humility. No, we, we love seeing the arrogant person put in their place. We get really ticked off when people are full of themselves. Uh, but we certainly do bristle if someone else comes along and tells us, you need to be humble. And we very much treat humility as this kind of thing that everyone needs to discover for themselves. So you might take this the wrong way, but here it goes. You and I and everyone, we must all humble ourselves before God. Psalm 18, 27 reminds us that we have a God whom it has said, You save the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty or proud. For see, there are, as I've been saying, no limits on God's forgiveness. But there are conditions. He doesn't just forgive automatically. And you must recognize your need for forgiveness. You must recognize the source of forgiveness. 
Now you can go reading on in 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 33, and you'll read there about Manasseh's son, Ammon, where it says, unlike his father Manasseh, he did not humble himself before the Lord. Ammon increased his guilt. You see, our debt because of sin, there's only two ways it's going to go. It's either going to be paid off in full by another, or it will just increase day by day. Now, I read to you part of the parable of the unmerciful servant. We're all supposed to identify with that man who owes the 10,000 bags of gold. We're all supposed to recognize that God has forgiven each and one of us a huge debt. Because I recognize, you might read this story of Manasseh, and you might think, okay, but I am not Manasseh. Like, I've done some things, but I am nowhere close to where Manasseh is at. But you don't have to be like Manasseh to be massively indebted to the perfect God who has made us all, blessed us all with life, worked joy in our hearts, and given us countless good things. When Jesus tells the parable of the unmerciful servant, he is talking in the first place to Peter. One of his closest disciples, one of his most devoted followers. He tells Peter, you owe God an impossible debt. Most of us are not Manasseh. We have not broken God's commands in big, dramatic ways. You know, I've never broken the first commandment by dragging a big golden statue of Buddha and putting it at the front of Refuge Church and been like, hey guys, let's try this God for a change. Like, I have never encouraged anyone to worship another God if we understand that in a very literal, strict sense. But I've had times in my life where things were going south. And my first inclination was not to trust in the God of the universe, the God who rules over all things. No, I trusted first in my work ethic or my intelligence, my abilities, the resources I had in life. And so broken the first commandment anyways. I could say most Canadians would probably find it relatively easy to have me as a neighbor. You know, I never take my trash and throw it into my neighbor's backyard. Thought about it. But I don't. Generally kind and respectful to all those I meet. I speak politely. If they cut me off, I'm a little bit angry. Maybe I hit the horn. I don't flip them the bird. But if I read the Sermon on the Mount, you know what Jesus says in Matthew 5 to 7, where he talks about things like keeping your word and not lusting and not being angry and trusting in God completely to give us all the things we need in life. I can see I have broken God's standards countless times. I'd like to meet those standards. I try to meet those standards. But often I do not. And I fall far short of deserving to live in God's presence and have God for a neighbor. Our sins, our imperfections might not seem like a big deal to others. Maybe they don't even seem like a big deal to us. But we must be clear that it represents a debt to God that we can never pay. A debt which Jesus Christ had to pay for us. The debt which Jesus Christ has paid for us.
No matter what kind of person you are, you may be assured of God's willingness to forgive. You might be the sort of person where others find it easy to get along with you. You might be the sort of person where people find it very difficult to get along with you. But there are no limits on God's forgiveness. Humble yourself. You say, be willing to go to God. Admit that you've done wrong. Say you're sorry. Request his forgiveness in Christ's name. And you will have it. Right then, right there, without you proving yourself, without you paying for it. Believe, confess, and experience the abundant forgiveness given by our God. I'm not saying that's the end of the story. Not saying for Christians it's do horrible things and then just go to God, say sorry, and then continue going on doing the horrible things. It's not God's plan for you. God's plan is for the forgiveness to but be but the first step, an incredible new life that He will work in you and for you. Forgiveness isn't about getting a spiritual get out of jail free card. But it's about turning to God and then letting him do his work. Manasseh prayed to God. God accepted that prayer, listened to it. And then God began to work all sorts of changes in Manasseh's life. Brought him back to his kingdom. So Manasseh could be in a position to try to undo some of the horrible things he had done, to take down some of those altars he had built, to point the people once again at the one true God. When we go to God, we shouldn't be surprised when we start seeing some pretty seismic changes in our own life. I'm not saying... Repent, turn to God, and he will give you a kingdom. You know, whatever good you had in the past, that'll come back to you. But we can count on the fact that when we turn to God, and we look to him, he does start to pour out his blessings upon us. Real blessings. Not the perishable kind like silver or gold, but the real ones. Like a heart full of joy, and peace, and love, no matter your circumstances. Real blessings like contentment, patience, even when you're going through the hard times. Blessings like a community of other people committed to walking with you, committing to be there for you. God didn't just forgive Manasseh. He transformed him blessed him, put him on a whole new path. Because God isn't just looking to forgive us. He is looking to transform us for our benefit and for the benefit of countless people around us. Now the Lord's Prayer teaches us, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. The parable of the unmerciful servant goes on to remind us of the importance of not just receiving forgiveness, but extending it to each and every one around us. We have a God who forgives us in Jesus Christ. And there are no limits on that forgiveness. But there is a vision or objective with that forgiveness. That we would be remade to be more like Christ who has saved us. 
that we be remade, that we might love God out of thankfulness, love people around us out of thankfulness. There is a vision that from this unlimited forgiveness that God extends to us, that the world might get to begin to experience through us some of the unlimited forgiveness of our God. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that there are no limits on what you are willing to forgive. We thank you that every one of us, no matter the things we have done or the things we are caught up in, is beyond your salvation. Help us to recognize, help us to believe for ourselves that we can go to you. We can ask for your forgiveness. And we can have it. Because of what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. Because while we have often fallen short, while we owe you a great debt because of what we have done, in Christ, we have someone who is willing to redeem us, willing to pay our ransom, who's been willing to atone and cover up our every mistake, our every error, our every sin, that we can be accepted by you, that we might be loved by you, that we might look forward to a joyful eternity with you, life eternal never ends. Father, we pray. We pray that you would help all of us to look to Jesus Christ. That you would help all of us to have the humility to recognize we are not perfect in ourselves, but we can be perfect in your sight because of him. Pray, Father, bless this church and the work that it does. Bless us as it seeks to extend to the world around a message of forgiveness and grace in Christ your Son. In his name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand if you're able. We're going to sing together, Come, Thou Fount of Every Blessing.